There's this really widely held assumption that if a story has talking animals in it, it's probably for kids. I mean, <laughs> grown-ups know that animals can't talk, obviously. So if our hero is a charming little mouse or a whimsical rabbit or a talking cat or dog, their adventure will surely be something fluffy and shallow, unlikely to resonate with the parents in the audience. What does a mouse in an ascot know of serious things, like taxes or infidelity? Now, I'm not entirely sure where this idea came from. I think it's an offshoot of the more broad idea that fantasy is for kids, which is something Tolkien famously fought against very aggressively. And Tolkien did the world a service by proving, once and for all, that a story could have magic and wizards and fairy tale motifs while still being very grown up. Steeped in the horrors of a world torn apart by war, meditations on the petty, selfish cruelty of evil, staggering portrayals of the deep and invisible scars that war leaves on its soldiers, and the slow, monotonous agony of the march to the end of the journey. But because the only talking animals Tolkien prominently featured were noble eagles, the talking animal side of fairy tales didn't really get the post-Lord of the Rings facelift the rest of the folklore space enjoyed. Wizards and elves and magic rings got a nice precedent to be taken seriously, but talking animals stayed over in the Narnia side of things, which, despite getting weirder and hornier with time and sequels, remained very fixated on childhood as a necessary prerequisite for getting whimsically isekai'd into fairyland to kick it with God's persona. What I'm saying is talking animals still get stereotyped as a kid thing, despite a truly shocking number of stories that seem hell-bent on disproving that through the rather obvious method of acknowledging the brutality of nature red in tooth and claw. Stories about mice, rats, rabbits, and rodents of all stripes have made their forays into scarring unsuspecting youth whose parents saw a bunny on the cover and assumed it was baby friendly. So today let's talk about a very interesting genre that examines what happens when you take a small mammal and put them in a big scary world. The basic structure of these stories is pretty simple. In general, the world at large is a familiar setting to the audience, something approximating the real world with farmers in their fields, cities in their sewers, and other such trappings of real life. The twist, of course, is that instead of following a human protagonist, the story focuses on a small mammal living in the nooks and crannies of this familiar world. The exact species of small mammal varies. Lots of these stories focus on heroic mice, with rats as de facto antagonists, but some of them let rats be good guys too. Rabbits get a decent amount of focus, and a certain book series I never got into focused entirely on cats. But for the majority of small mammal in a scary world stories, what matters about our protagonists is that they are very small, very fragile, and often rather unsure of the machinations of humans. And given that real world humans have a tendency to kill small mammals that pop up in their spaces, a twist of extreme peril enters the narrative very early on. When our heroes are rodents or rabbits, humble farmers become existential threats, and cats and dogs become full-blown monsters. While most elements of the environment will be familiar and mundane to the audience, seeing them from the perspective of something very small changes their potential use in the story. A discarded shoebox can be home, a random seabird can be a vital and powerful ally, a half-filled bathtub can be a deadly threat. This combo of quirks provides a very solid narrative basis. A world and setting the readers are already familiar with needs no explanation, but since our POV characters are very small and very vulnerable, that familiar setting feels very different to them than it does to the audience. So the writer barely needs to exposit anything, but the readers still reap the benefits of dramatic irony, aka knowing something that the characters don't. So the vibe of the setting is generally fairly consistent. The big scary world is some slice of reality, possibly with a little added magic or mysticism layered over otherwise very familiar architecture and environments. Where these stories immediately start distinguishing themselves from one another is in how human the small mammals are. There's a steep gradient of anthropomorphization, where some small mammal scary world stories have animals speaking English, wearing clothes, and even chatting with humans on the regs, and the other end of the spectrum that verges on full-blown xenofiction, where the animals are completely animal and only minimally anthropomorphized by the writer for the purposes of translation conventions so they can write the story in English. And this has a huge effect on the feel of the story, because it affects how the main characters see humans and the human world. And while these stories are not about humans, the role that humans play in the story is pretty central to the tone, on account of how humans are the primary audience for it. In a small mammal scary world narrative, humans can be anything from a total non-entity to an utterly mundane facet of the environment to an inscrutable cosmic nightmare, and these are tonally very different and shape the world in important ways. In the heavily anthropomorphized stories, where the small mammals are basically just small humans, real humans and small mammal humans might not really have any differences beyond scale and whether or not they have to wear pants. In some versions, humans and the small mammals du jour will even be able to talk to one another, producing a world that resembles reality a lot less on account of how it has talking animals on good terms with talking humans. For instance, the tale of Despero has a very fairy tale vibe and takes this angle, with mice, rats, and humans all sort of knowing about each other's various
these civilizations and rules, even if some of the humans are occasionally surprised at a chatty rodent. For a more theoretically grounded setting, Disney's Rescuers takes this approach a little less overtly, where almost all animals can just talk to people and vice versa, but this doesn't seem to be particularly acknowledged or widely known, with the mouse civilization flying under the radar seemingly just because humans don't pay that much attention most of the time. And the humans don't pay attention cover is a fairly common implication in these settings, along with its corollary concept, that these stories are a sneak peek into the secret lives of familiar critters, and that these fun-sized hero's journeys could be happening right under our noses in real life. It's pretty rare for the human background noise in these stories to be broadly aware of the small mammal civilization in any meaningful sense that would consequentially reshape the world, because the setting broadly resembling reality is one of its major strengths, which means all the fantastical elements, like rat construction projects or mice in waistcoats, need to be hidden from the humans in the setting to avoid spoiling the illusion. Sometimes this is done fairly casually, with the implication that humans just don't notice small fancy mice running around in tiny copies of people clothes, which is the approach they take in The Great Mouse Detective, where there's an entire parallel London with mouse versions of major characters like Sherlock Holmes and the actual queen, and the humans just never really factor into it or notice. But in some stories, the heavily anthropomorphized small mammals might basically be a secret world urban fantasy, where their intelligence, civilization, and human-like qualities in general must be actively hidden for their safety. So the world of the story looks like reality, but only because the highly advanced small mammal civilization is purposefully maintaining absolute secrecy. This is the way they handle it in Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Neem, where the world is explicitly meant to be reality and the aforementioned rats are super intelligent not because of suspension of disbelief, but due to garden variety genetic experimentation, and are trying to hide this fact from humans while figuring out what direction to take their fledgling civilization. Our POV character in the book, Mrs. Frisbee, is basically just an ordinary mouse who is very out of her depth when faced with the concepts of reading and medicine, and is astounded by the tech and infrastructure that the super rats have worked out. This is one example where the movie adaptation kind of completely changes the tone, because the character designs get significantly more anthropomorphized. Like all the small mammals are wearing clothes all the time, including the slightly renamed Mrs. Brisby, who is not a genetically engineered super mouse and thus has no business wearing clothes. It's not just the pantsification of the protagonist that contributes to the vibe, the cinder block the Brisby family lives in is dollhoused up to look a lot nicer and more furnished, where in the original it's basically just a conveniently large rock with a nest in it. And that's not even touching on the magic amulet thing. I'll get to the magic amulet thing. Anyway, in some of the more out there anthropomorphized stories, humans might not show up or be addressed at all, and the world is just populated by intelligent animals doing all the standard human things like building construction and having prophecies of doom, which is the approach taken in the Redwall series, where the world just seems to be completely human free, like how the mice monks featured in the first book live in a mouse-sized abbey built by mice. These stories could basically just be full-on fantasy universes where the characters just happen to be animals instead of humanoid. In general, there's kind of a pattern of these more anthropomorphized stories focusing on the small mammal protagonists living among or functionally replacing humans, understanding them, even mirroring them, like Mouse Sherlock Holmes or the Mouse Queen of England or the Mouse Delegations from the Mouse United Nations. It's comedic, and of course everybody loves a tiny adorable version of a regular sized thing. Humans in these stories are usually either fellow protagonists, villains threatening those human protagonists, or just part of the background, too large and inattentive to notice our tiny heroes going on their tiny adventures. But on the more xenofiction side of the anthropomorphization gradient, the story's angle on humans can get a lot more unnerving. And for this, we should start talking about Watership Down. Now, when I said that there was a gradient of anthropomorphization, that was true. But what I didn't mention is that most stories in this genre are clustered at the far end. At absolute peak anthropomorphization, we get things like The Dark Portal, which is a story where the mice don't just wear clothes, they also have hair and jewelry and coming-of-age ceremonies. Just below that, you get the Disney Mouse movies, where mice typically wear clothes and have organized government, and then you start getting stuff like the Rats of Neem, where the critters don't wear clothes and are actively trying to find a way to live without humans. But they are still in the business of speaking English and engineering electronics. And then way, way at the other end of the spectrum, skewing the curve completely, is Watership Down. Now the characters in Watership Down are rabbits. They do not wear clothes, they do not speak English, they are rabbits. They worry about rabbit things, like having enough food, making enough babies, and not getting eaten by one of the 1,000 things that wants to eat them. They have their own mythology and understanding of the world, and because they are rabbits, their creation myth is all about explaining why everything in the world wants to eat them, and how they can be fast and tricky enough to not let that happen. They certainly know humans exist. Humans are one of the things that try to eat them sometimes. But the rabbits in the burrow don't really deal with humans that much, and worry more about tangible, immediate threats, like foxes and unleashed dogs. So when a sign goes up at the edge of their field, all they know is that the humans put up some wooden thing with markings on it. They can't read English, so they don't know that it says the field is going to become the home of a beautiful new 
housing development, and they certainly wouldn't understand what that means if they could read it. They don't understand human construction work, or exterminators, or poison gas. All they know is that their resident oracular bunny, Fiverr, loses his goddamn mind about the sign and panics. And he doesn't understand it either. He has absolutely no context to understand it, but somehow he can feel that the innocuous sign is the herald of absolute destruction on a scale they can't even comprehend. This is Cassandra screaming the destruction of Troy, but rabbits. Throughout the book, the rabbits encounter many things they don't understand, including cars, which they understand as loud, unbelievably fast animals that don't hunt them but do sometimes kill completely harmless creatures seemingly for no reason, and a train, which, because it serendipitously wipes out some antagonists chasing them, they believe was a literal act of divine intervention. And this is interesting, isn't it? Because the reader knows what all of this means. Even through uncomprehending rabbit eyes, a reader can piece together that, oh, from the way they're describing it, they're standing on train tracks. They probably shouldn't do that. When a survivor of the original burrow's horrific destruction explains that the exit tunnels were collapsed and the air turned bad somehow, the readers know that a bunch of human exterminators probably came in with poison gas to wipe out the burrow before they broke ground on the construction site. This is the dramatic irony we talked about earlier. The audience has information, the characters don't. The characters are navigating a world terrifying and incomprehensible, and the danger is very real, and in many cases, the reader has a chance to figure out dangers that most of the characters have no way of understanding, which produces a feeling of dread. The audience has a perfect understanding of the world that the characters are struggling to comprehend and survive. What we are seeing here is dramatic irony, cosmic horror, a combination I have seen in no other genre. This is like if we were the eldritch horrors reading the color out of space. Like, no little humans, get out of there! The color pusgenta is very bad for organics! From the perspective of the characters, it's an incomprehensible nightmare. From the perspective of the reader, it's common knowledge. But that won't save the characters. The characters experience cosmic horror, the audience experiences dramatic irony, and the writer barely needs to do any work to make it happen because the audience and the characters are just looking at the same thing from two very different angles, and the audience's expected familiarity with the setting of the story is a huge central element of the genre. It's just baked in. There's a webcomic called Scurry that I wanted to highlight here and spoil just a little bit because it illustrates this perfectly. It's a very low anthropomorphization setting, a colony of mice hiding out in an abandoned house, worrying about things like having enough food and not getting eaten by cats. And they're also worrying about how it feels like winter has lasted kinda longer than usual. And it's been really cloudy for so long that they've barely seen the sun in, like, ages. And they're really low on food. And, you know, they mostly survive by scavenging food from human homes, but they haven't seen any humans in, like, a really long time. And all the houses they've been raiding are completely cleaned out. And they've sent a few scouts towards the nearby city to try and find more food or more humans, but those scouts never come back. And at one point, they find the body of one of those scouts, and he's just dead. He's dead. He went to the city, came about halfway back, and dropped dead. Huh. So, Clearly, something is horribly wrong. And between an extra long winter, a lot of dust in the air, absolutely no humans anywhere, and a major population center where getting close to it seems to just make you die, anyone who's been alive and paying attention since the Cold War has a pretty good shot at diagnosing what happened here. Signs point to a little bit of a nuclear Armageddon situation. But how can we expect mice to know that? How can we expect anybody not steeped in the post-Cold War cultural zeitgeist to recognize what a nuclear nuclear winter looks like. Well, luckily for our heroes, an explanation of the apocalypse comes after almost 200 pages from a possum that lived up close to the humans and witnessed the end of the world. But of course, she is a possum, and thus does not have anything resembling the complete context for nuclear Armageddon. So from her perspective, the humans were struck with a plague of madness that spread all over the world and drove them to launch their most powerful weapons at the stars themselves. The possum struggles to explain what the retaliation of the stars looked like to the protagonist, who is a mouse, and eventually eventually describes the resulting destruction as great wolf packs. First a terrible wolf of fire, feasting on the city and the humans within, the mere sight of it blinding witnesses and driving them mad, and then a sky wolf that swallowed the sun and poisoned the land, killing many animals. This is a horrific and beautiful mythologization of a modern Armageddon through the eyes of something that cannot possibly understand it the same way the readers can. And while her narration is very mythic and broadly inaccurate, the visuals make it very clear to an in-the-know human audience exactly what is going on, or at least 
least in loose terms, that there was some sort of political unrest, lots of rioting, followed by some kind of mutually assured destruction. And now, most importantly, the audience knows the shape of the threat and the world the protagonists have to navigate. The audience knows that radiation is a constant danger, that the humans probably aren't coming back anytime soon, that the weather will not magically get better, and that the long-term prospects of the mouse protagonists aren't looking too hot if their plan is to continue scavenging a dwindling supply of canned food. Dramatic irony, cosmic horror. Also, just as a quick side note, but this is the most beautifully illustrated comic I've ever seen. I'd be seething with envy if I weren't so distracted by this beautiful snake texture. Give it a read through. There's a lot I haven't spoiled, and it's real pretty. In most storytelling, there's a bit of a fixation on making sure the readers can relate to the protagonists. We spend most of our time in or near the POV character's head, and surely that can't be comfortable if it's a head that doesn't fit. An unrelatable protagonist must be doomed to be seen only from the outside by an unsympathetic audience, says the conventional wisdom. The audience cannot care about their struggles if they can't feel and understand them. Therefore, characters must be precision designed to be as relatable as possible. But what I love about this genre is how all of its most unique strengths are built on denying that. The more anthropomorphized and human, and thus quote-unquote relatable the main characters are, the less it feels like we're getting a fun new perspective on a familiar world, and the more it feels like we gotta start suspending our disbelief about talking mice. You can't get the unique strength of dramatic irony cosmic horror if the audience and the POV character are on the same page. Page. It can only happen if the POV character regards what is familiar and known to the audience as incomprehensible, dangerous, and utterly beyond their understanding. And it proves that getting inside a character's head can be more exciting the more wildly different from the audience the character is. By relatable protagonist theory, seeing a familiar world through alien eyes shouldn't be fun. But it is. The absolute central strength of this genre is how easily it plays with perspective, and it's always very cool to see that played to the hilt. If we can have fun seeing a familiar, relatable protagonist take on an unfamiliar fantastical world, it does kind of track that we'd also have fun seeing a familiar world through fantastical eyes. Also, this isn't really central to the genre, but there's a very specific subtrope that crops up in these stories that I wanted to bring up, mostly because I can't decide if I think it's funny or really annoying, and that trope is magic is real but only for mice. See, stories where the humans are inattentive, vaguely dangerous background monoliths theoretically living normal, realistic lives in a normal, realistic world will frequently feature the heroic small mammals dealing with explicitly supernatural things, like ghosts, prophecies, non-canonical magic amulets, and even divine intervention. Some of it is just that tasty, dramatic irony cosmic horror, like the Watership Down rabbits thinking a timely train is an act of God. But some of it is actual, full-blown magic, like Watership Down's oracular rabbit Fiverr and a quick in-person appearance from the mythical rabbit rabbit culture hero El Herrera at the end of the book. Magic but only for mice is also a huge part of the novel The Dark Portal, which features everything from ghosts to oracles to acts of mouse god, producing an odd blend of grounded dramatic irony horror and fantastical out of nowhere horror. One of the major twists in that book is that the dark god the rats worship and serve is secretly the most horrifying thing they could ever imagine, a cat. A very fun revelation that is played exactly like a Lovecraftian nightmare that actively drives at least one character irreparably mad, but then and also, the cat is a wizard and breathes fire. It just... it's interesting. I don't really know how I feel about it. On the one hand, I almost think it weakens the impact of the story by reducing the familiarity of the setting and adding world-building elements that the reader needs to have explained to them in order to get back to the dramatic irony that's such a central strength of the genre. But on the other hand, I love how it worked in Watership Down and how it added this mythical texture to the setting that never felt like it demanded further explanation and was instead just looped into the uniquely inhuman way the rabbits perceived the world around them. Something about horrific visions of future doom just feels like a very appropriate superpower for a rabbit to have in a world full of things whose favorite food is rabbit. Like, I would entirely believe that some rabbits can actually see the future and know how they're going to die. Look this hare in the eye and tell me that's not what it's thinking. So I can't categorically think this subtrope is bad, because I've seen it done really well. But it does feel like it can kind of lessen the impact sometimes. I do know why this subtrope happens. It's because the secret small mammal civilization thing is basically just a reflavoring of the secret hidden magical world urban fantasy trope. They fill the same secret space in the setting and have a lot of elements in common, so layering one on the other is strangely easy. The mouse civilization is already secret, so it doesn't break the theoretical realism of the setting if the secret mice also have secret mouse magic. It just always leaves me with so many follow-up world-building questions. I can never stop wondering if the existence of rodent gods have broader implications about human religions, or if tangible proof of a rodent afterlife reflects on the world at large, but that, honestly, 
might just be a me problem. Maybe I'm just still mad about the Secrets of Nim Amulet thing. The book is just so aggressively focused on engineering and genetic modification and the scientific method, and it really builds out this extremely plausible feeling world where everything makes sense. And then the movie is like, yes to all of that, we'll recreate the entire Nim story totally faithfully, but then also, the science rats have a magical telekinesis amulet. No follow-up questions. This might be a weird breaking point to have, but damn it, I like my stories tonally consistent, whether or not the protagonists are talking rats. So, yeah. <laughs>